Hello. As Warhammer Fantasy evolved, it did so through changes that were sometimes incremental and sometimes massive. New approaches to classic concepts were discovered, and in some cases, fundamental stuff like the nature of certain armies was radically redesigned. A couple of such major changes were spearheaded by a designer who would have a lasting impact on the world of Warhammer, who would go on to create Mordheim. Following his radical overhaul, the forces of chaos and the powers of magic would never be the same again. And we're going to talk about the how and why of both. I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and today I'm in conversation with Thomas Pyrenin. Thomas, thank you so much for joining me. I, I really appreciate you taking the time. I thought maybe we'd start with just a little bit of background to your time working at Games Workshop and working on Warhammer, if we could. Yes. So this goes far back into the, the, the lens of memory. But around 95, 96, I started Games Workshop. It's the, the first, like, just a little bit of time. I actually worked at Citadel Journal before they decided that they now I'm wasted there. Then they did what they did with everybody who was going into the games development. I did a year stint at White Wolf. I was then promoted into a uh, junior game developer, then game developer, senior game developer, and eventually running the Warhammer side of the uh, design. Um, so I, on my time, I was responsible for the uh, core box games, uh, specialist box games uh, to do with the Warhammer, uh, the fantasy setting, army books, campaigns, uh, supplements like the Siege, it's the, the, and the, one of the subjects of the today's uh, discussion, which is, of course, the Realm of Chaos box set. Um, so on a nutshell, that's my uh, sort of a six-year-ish uh, the, the involvement, I say, the, the working for Games Workshop. And I've stayed active in the community. It's the, I spend a lot of time, uh, especially on the Mordheim, uh, social media because the 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 game so close to my heart. There's a wonderful wonderful community there, um, and it's the the it's fascinating to see a game that you wrote over twenty years ago. It's the it's the just growing every year, which is just amazing for a product that has no official support. It shows the strength of community. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, more time, more and more loved. Just every passing year, you're right. It's, it seems to be more talk about it and more sort of stuff going on with it. Um, yeah. yeah, I suppose Warhammer itself continues to, to <laughs> be very, very interesting to a lot of people as well. And you mentioned there the, the Realm of Chaos box. So yeah, we we can get into that. And that was a, a new approach for Chaos in Warhammer, right? So previously, the Warhammer Armies book for Chaos that came out in 4th edition had kind of lumped everything together. You had all of the different gods of Chaos, all the different types of Chaos, flavors of Chaos, if you like, in a single army. So you might have some demons and some beast men and some Chaos warriors. You took a radically different approach, really, with the, the Realm of Chaos box that you released. So what was the sort of design approach there that, that led you to that? Well, part of it is like the interesting thing is that there was, there was always a great deal of nervousness uh, within the Games Workshop about chaos. It's a huge part of the mythos, the lore, and the extremely popular uh, the, the, uh, faction for both for 40k and fantasy. Uh, but the, the, the two seminal Realm of Chaos books, the, the, the Slaves of Darkness and Lost uh, and the Damned, had, they had, like, when you mentioned them to the old guard, they had nervous twitch. Because those books, while absolute classics of gaming and, and hugely revered for a many good reasons, were also like the uh, brought the company within an inch of bankruptcy because they were so expensive and hard to make and took so much effort and the 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 focus. They were really the 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 favorite child of uh, the the Mad King Brian Ansel. Uh, it's the the and at that point there were no computers, so he wanted tons of changes. That meant that the, everything had to be written and laid uh, out again on paper. So uh, and they cost like in the eighties pounds, like one million pound each to produce, which was catastrophic. Uh, so while they are incredibly beloved by the by the the the, the community at that point internally in Games Workshop, they. And doing anything with chaos was a, a a source of great worry and nervousness. 
Um, so the um, when I took on the chaos, it's the I had all that background uh, pressure on that. On the other hand, it's super important and the the um, uh, the the revered and uh, important part of the business. There was a history of it going off rails and causing terrible chaos and damage. And it's quite appropriate, I'd say. <laughs> sure. So, so the, to me, the really the the problem as a games designer was that it was very hard to get a chaos into a cohesive army list. Is the the because everything was jumbled together, which in one sense was very characterful, like it was truly chaotic from the point of point of view of the, the having a coherent product lines. It's the the having a any semblance of balance. It's the or having a a, a clear identity, which was the biggest one for me. Is that that was difficult. So to me, in the same way as the the I divided the the undead into the 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 sort of the Egyptian Cambrian undead and the vampire counts. It's the here I said what are the the big building blocks, and there really was the the chaos warriors and the the beastmen and then the demons and while i still allowed those to mix to an extent it's the it still meant that every demon army had a the 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 demons were the core of it the chaos warriors were led by a great chaos lords it's the and had a ranks of wilds of chaos warriors chaos knights chariots and marauders which i added into back into the game there and then the beastmen which were really my favorite part which was the the bestial horde? It's the the having these the the bring on new types of the the uh beastmen like the angors and the creating bestigors. It's the uh to have a like a coherent army list and and the, each one of them having a, uh, their own strength. And then even more risky was making the army selection completely unique instead of using the same method for every single other army. It's the, the, these were all selected by uh, choosing a leader and then a retinue they had, which had to uh, match in points values, which allowed a um, more structure to the list. It's the, and a very unique flavor because you build it thinking of these retinues rather than the pick and mix candies, mm -hmm. which meant that the armies tended to be quite cohesive looking and the sort of the, having a identity on the battlefield. But it was a big risk because we were asking players to learn a completely new way of selecting armies. It was also a remarkable book from the point of view that it was the first book where me, uh, the the and the relationship I had with John Blanche really blossomed. Because he obviously had a huge part of making the original Realm of Chaos books. The the fourth edition Chaos is the was not really in his wheelhouse when you look at it. So then he wanted to step back in because it was for him creatively important. And, and we found sort of kindred souls and we did a lot, lot of work together. I would write a piece of text. He would do a full page illustration. He would do a full, full page illustration. I would write a text to go with it. Um, and our relationship was very sort of organic. Like the, like I said in a previous interview, it's the, I don't think there's ever been a one crossword between the two of us. It's the, sometimes you have people that you just, the, the you harmonize with hmm. um and the rick priestley was there along all the way helping me because this was a very big project and the, it was a box set as opposed to a book so the games workshop was putting quite a bit of ammo behind it because it was chaos and there was a lot of nervousness uh, within the company with the the from the point of view of the financial success cost doing such a radical change into such a core seller was a risk, which luckily paid off. <laughs> and that, because I mean, it was a, obviously a, a dramatic release. It, that big box that had so much in it that did revolutionize the sort of thinking of chaos and the way people were approaching chaos. W was there ever a thought of, well, actually, we could do it a bit more conservatively? Let's just do a couple of smaller books. And, and this sort of thing was explored in later editions, of course, as well. But what, what was the thinking that was, let's do it as a big box and really? Just go all out on it. Um, well, that was like the, I had an idea and then I had Rick's backing. Like he was just that, yep, let's do it that way. And Rick was at that point a board director. Uh, so even if somebody disagreed, it's the, well, sucks to be you, I guess. It's the, <laughs> Tom Kirby obviously could have overruled him, but the Tom was not really 
into uh, doing a, at that point, backseat driving in the design department because it was Rick's wheelhouse. So the, the, uh, if they were, Rick shielded me from the, the such worries. Uh, but also it's the, I've done a fair bit of the, the stuff that had been successful already. So, and I had a relationship, a personal relationship with the guys at sales. So I had advocates I know on that side of the, the, the fence. It's the, they believe that the, the stuff I would do, it's the, I would have a sensible head on my shoulders and not go off the rails. Cause of course with the Brian Ansel, who was, I, I have a lot of, he was a very, very hard man, but I, there's a lot to admire. Like he made. Games Workshop, a financial success during the deep dolorums of the British economy when everything was going to hell. He was actually managing to grow a, such a niche company. And he was a game designer of sorts. It's maybe not very focused, but he did a lot of stuff that we still consider classic. So, um, so but the, the, he, of course, could not be overruled. He was the boss at that point. So the um, if there were nervousness, it's the it did not... The, the filter to me, uh, there was the, the Robin Deuce and the Rick Studas, the the the, the, the Falangian god on the gates of the design studio. <laughs> um, yeah, go ahead. Well, did you, how much did you go back to those Realm of Chaos books in the creation of, of your version of Realm of Chaos? Were you using them as like real references or was it just sort of come up with yes. your own stuff more? Yeah, no, it's the, the it was for the lore, definitely. Like, and there was a lot of fascinating stuff on the the that ultimately wasn't usable. Like, there was a beastman of every chaos guard, and the problem there was that the, we would have a four times the model range for the same models in a shop where there is a limited space, uh, as it is today still. But back then, especially, we had a lot of ranges of miniatures, and chaos was a huge range. So if I'd went and said that the, the okay, let's have a every chaos. Uh, the uh, Beastman and have four versions of it for everything, all the troop types I came up with, there would be nothing else in Games Workshop shops and that would be a no-go for business. And this isn't, by the way, somebody said to me. I knew it from the from the the, the working at studio is the learning to think in a certain way because nobody wants to be the, the the guy who comes and tells designers it's the 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 how to do the product ratings. Alan Merritt helped me a lot there. It's the, they say I have to they give him credit. Uh, I also had a lot of the people who were involved in the original Chaos book still working there who wouldn't touch it with a 10 <laughs> uh, for the obvious reasons. Um, but the the uh, there was a couple of things like I did is the I, I made the 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 Beastman follow the sort of the Chaos undivided. So the model range would have a, a cohesive look and not be so sprawling because I don't think anybody would have bought the the uh, all those models and for the chaos warriors it's the, the we really went to town with the 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 flavor of the gods uh for each of them and, and then the the chaos demons well they were demons it's the they so you went all out um so the but the original books were absolutely law favor like the the older stuff about the chaos runes the herd stones the the and so on but i also found weaknesses there because one thing i thought that right each a chaos warrior is like they could lay a waste on a single town by themselves. Mm. So it, it can't be that that's everybody in the chaos waste. And where the hell do they all come from? Because it describes these huge armies, and 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 there would be nobody left in Empire and Bretonia if they all became chaos warriors. Because the the it always was that the chaos armies were way bigger than the 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 free peoples could ever muster. So that's why I came up with the Chaos Marauders, who would have the, the like would be the bulk of the army, still terrifyingly powerful, but not godlike, like the Chaos Warriors and Knights. And the the would give a natural source of people. It's the to to uh join into the ranks. And I still kept the the corruption aspect, like the a lot of the chaos sorcerers and warriors do come from Empire. You might remember in the companion volume to the Realm of Chaos, the Champions of Chaos that I wrote, there is the story about the corruption of a Reichsguard knight who becomes a chaos knight. I won't describe that. But that could not be everybody because the, there would be no knights in, in, in Empire if that was the case. Um, so the the they were very important, but more from the point of view of lore than the game design side. And how did you deal with that sort of the fact that chaos are unique in in Warhammer and 40k and that they cross over between those two game systems and, and universes essentially? 
was there any did you have to work closely with the designers in the 40k space to make sure that you were keeping things aligned or what was that kind of approach like Again, that was like atmospheric, like the uh, Jervis and Andy and Gav, who were mainly working on 40K. Well, they were the 40K department at that point. Is the were right there next to me. So uh, you just chatted what we were doing about and gave feedback. It, there wasn't no official structure for it. Uh, but we also always had this thinking that the, the, the Warhammer world, in, in at least the cosmology that was given to me, that Brian Ansel wrote and the one that I believe in, it is in the they are in the same universe, but it is in a within the storm of chaos that it can never be reached by the 40k. And because of the distorting effect, there could be a billion years of time difference. A a travel distance that could be at the same time one inch or 50 trillion light years. So and the the, the that would all be within the realm of chaos. It's the uh so even though the worlds are connected, especially by chaos gods and chaos and the sort of the cos underlying cosmology, they would never touch. There was some dabbling of that, like in the old uh, Warhammer Siege, is the sort of the the and in the old realm of chaos books. But really, uh, doing the the beastmen with bolters and the the uh, last guns, um, I don't. There was no appetite, not in me, not in the, the anybody in the within the studio, and I don't ultimately think that much in the fan base. Mm -hmm. uh, fantasy kind of people like it being a fantasy. There has been some successful uh, mixings of the the sci-fi and fantasy, like the Final Fantasy series, but those tend not to be the core audience for, especially for tabletop. Mm. Sure, yeah. And you mentioned the the Champions of Chaos book yeah. there as well. So how, how did that come about as a, a sort of separate entity to the, yeah. the core Realm of Chaos book or box? Well, it it was, well, partly it was physical, like the, as you might remember from that point in the, the of time, the, the books that Games Workshop made there, finding wasn't very good. So the, the with the, uh, there was both, both a time pressure to finish the Realm of Chaos box, which was a huge job, almost as big as a box game. And then there was the book that we were nervously looking like it was getting thicker. And it was getting to the point that we knew that if you open it, all the, the, the pages fall out and it falls apart. And that's embarrassing. Uh, so part of it was that the, the, I didn't really have time to do it at the same time as finishing the box. But a big part also was that the, the book's getting too big. Is the, the, we don't want to sell a book that immediately falls apart when you open it. Um, it would have then have to be the hardback and nobody wanted to do a hardback because of the cost at that point. Uh, and that was part of the reason also why there was no longer combined realm of chaos that had both 40 K and the, the uh, uh, fantasy chaos and the champions of chaos. Cause if you look at it, a lot of people told me about that. The chaos books got a lot smaller, but if you look at it, actually what we produced with the 40 uh, K chaos book, the, the realm of chaos and the champions of chaos and all the supplements actually is quite a bit bigger than the old books. It was just, they, they put into pieces that they, they would actually stay together as a book and not fall apart. Hmm. I suppose one of the things I always wonder about people who are sort of working on chaos uh, and, and that kind of stuff, do, do you have a favorite chaos god? Is there one that you particularly like enjoy writing for the most or enjoy the look of or the feel of the most? I like Zinch, which is not that popular because I like the the like the logic that goes against logic. I like like long term plans in storytelling. It's the the it's not very popular uh, compared to say Corn. Slanesh also seems to enjoy a quite a bit of a a a favor. It's the so the people are maybe a little bit mistaken. It's the one thing the one advice Rick gave to me was that the uh, Slanesh is not just the god of pure sex. It's Temptation, vice, corruption of all kinds. It's the the it's giving in to your passions, but passions can be other than just purely of flesh. It's the the they can be intellectual, they can be a a, uh, a emotional in other senses. Uh, they can be um, a a much more sort of the 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 way that the xenobites are in the Hellraiser. It's the the uh, taking a, a which can be a good for humans in small or, or reasonable measures. It's the taken into an absolute extremes. It's terrifying. So Rick was always a bit miffed about the that the everything you see in Slanish goes straight into into the realm of sexual, which isn't wrong per se, but it's only encompasses a small part mm. of Slanish. It's the um 
But yeah, Zinch was very close to my heart. But I also do enjoy corn because sometimes you just want to kill everyone. <laughs> and um, I suppose in that sort of broader point about how, so they do represent these kind of bigger concepts. I mean, what was your sort of thinking when you were writing Chaos as entities within, as sort of actors within the Warhammer world? So how did you sort of square that circle of we've got these they're gods, they're infinitely powerful, but we're going to try and put them into this world and have them acting upon this world without mm. just wiping everything out and kind of making it interesting, making it sort of a, a, a an interesting story, I suppose. Yeah. I mean, the one thing that the, the has been there from the beginning of the Warhammer mythos is that the chaos will win, the, but what the free peoples can do is delay it. So it's ultimately a futile struggle but it's also is that the because the chaos gods are immortal and inscrutable to us their plans for them it's the the maybe they don't want to destroy the warhammer world immediately maybe they want to like the cost they the, the generate a power within the realm of chaos from mortal followers uh they want to uh, lengthen the suffering and see the, the 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 ruin to be slow and agonizing Maybe they want to lose sometimes. It's the the cause they like being cruel to their own followers too, and seeing them outdone and the the fall, uh, and seeing them turn into chaos spawn. Uh, similar kind of thing I'm the, the working on with the uh, trench crusade right now. But my line was that the an immortal being to them the war has been going on in Warhammer world for two and a half thousand years. It's the they were not sorry much more than that six thousand years. It's nothing. It's like a day. It's barely started. They are just, they are lengthening it because they have to have a bit more fun. For a human, lifetime is an eternity. For a chaos god, it's not even an eye blink. So for them, why why stop the fun while you're having it? It's the, why not carrying a little bit longer because you have all the time in the cosmos. Yeah. <laughs> and of course they did, they they went on to win and it was uh, uh, Archeon marching into the empire and and uh, he was one of your creations right from champions of chaos and we had, what was the uh so what was your thinking going into his creation and sort of building that character up the the the, the chaos we are human beings and we require a personification for both for the hero and the anti-hero the protagonist and antagonist and the one world was lacking the antagonist we had lots of protagonists uh because even the the like the leaders of say Skaven or Undead, they still wanted to retain the world. But the chaos was everybody's enemy in the end. Yeah, sure they could ally the the, the occasionally with the other evil forces, but the, the ultimately they wanted all them is the, the gone into a, a chaos goo as well. That was always the end plan. And but the problem there is that it's very difficult for you to root against a faceless enemy or an enemy that's like the if corn came on person to warm world it would just he would just kill everybody in an eye blink that's not a antagonist that's like a force of nature it's not really interesting so i wanted there to be a somebody that can personify the threat of chaos and work you can see actively see a plan that you can understand and that's how i came up with the gathering of the treasures of chaos it's the and made them then the items uh, on the battlefield, and they sort of have a story and see a plan in motion rather than just being a threat in the background. Plus, also I wanted to uh, I looked at the the like the great uh, fantasy archetype villains is the the Sauron or the the uh, maybe Abaddon in forty k and the. Um, Darth Vader in 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 uh, Star Wars, and I wanted there to be this menacing force that, like, if you were a movie poster, he would be the one that his huge helmet and form looms <laughs> in the background, uh, and that was the the Arcane roles. And looking at the, the how beloved that character still is, and the the how much, and that the the it's still, I mean, he still exists in the, even in the uh, the the uh, Age of Sigmar as a the major villain that. I must have done something right. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I mean, he's definitely a a very noteworthy character that has uh, had a, a long and, <laughs> I suppose, sadly for many, a very long and happy life, Archeon, fulfilling many of his dreams and, and succeeding. 
Um, one of the other things that was in the um, in the box for the Realm of Chaos was uh, lots of spells. You had lots of like chaotic magic, all, all that sort of stuff, because the the magic system for Warhammer at that time in Fifth Edition was still a card based system, yeah. right? So. As you moved into developing Warhammer for its sixth edition, that was one of the major changes that, that you implemented was getting rid of all of those cards and moving mm -hmm. to a dice-based magic system. Yeah. I wonder if you could sort of expand a little bit on what led to that kind of thinking and why there was a need to to move from cards to dice and sort of how you approached it. Oh, it's the, you can blame the change for a poor kid in Finland back in 90s, namely me, who wanted to play Warhammer, but they've been getting so many box sets with all the cards, which I love. People are often come to me and say, you must have hated them. So no, I ab absolutely love them. But I wanted to make the game more accessible to people uh, cost-wise, like the making the books and the, the what you need to play, because the money is made by miniatures. Uh, it's the... the uh, if there is a huge obstacles, monetary obstacles, before you can even read the rules, then you are really shrinking your audience. And you could see that as we went on to the, the new editions of 40K and Warhammer, the books actually got very small because the idea was that you need to be able to buy them on, as, on a fiver so people can buy miniatures, which is the, mm. the the actual business of the game, which makes actually in many ways it makes sense. So I do think you need that meat and bones of the lore as well. Uh but the dice system change was purely that the I wanted the sixth edition. You buy the box or the book, you got the game. It's the the and the you are you don't feel that you are being nickeled and dined. Now you can make counter arguments to that, but that was the reasoning. Uh, and also, it's the the I think the dice system in the end is the worked pretty well. It also meant that when you went to play, you had less stuff to take with you, you had less stuff to lose, you had less stuff to break. But for the box edition, I was giddy because I get to do all the chaos spells and the and the care the the chaos rewards. It's the the as these cool little cards that you could play. It's the uh, so uh, it wasn't that I'm anti card. I was more sort <laughs> of a pro poor kids. Sure. <laughs> But that dice system was was really effective. I think it's quite admired as well as as sort of a a really nice way of simplifying in one sense. Because like you say, you don't need all of these cards, you don't need all this extra stuff. You're already using the dice; it's already sort of built in. But it and it's quite quite intuitive at the same time as well. I mean, what how did you go about developing that the dice system and sort of moving across to to a dice led spellcasting system? Um, well, the very original idea was Andy Chambers saying, because I was saying that, look, I, I don't, don't I'm, I am want to deliver a full game. And the, the Alan is telling me, he's being a meanie, that I, I can't have all these cards. And I don't quite frankly want them because the cost would go so much. Up. And I said, well, you got dice in the box. And I said, yeah, I do. But the idea there was that I tried to die it to the army as much as possible. That's why you get the, like, the power dice are generated by the wizards or, or the the, the uh, rune lords of the dwarves is the, or the shamans is the, by your armies. So I tried to tie the system as much to the models you're fielding, which I think is why it works, because when you're building the army, you're thinking laterally. Okay, so I'm going to have this many wizards, because I want these power dice, and then I'll make these models. So it, you sort of have this virtuous circle by the cards, which I love. They are like a, a game within a game. They are like a, a, a side they are not tied as much to it. And also, while you're playing Warhammer, you use dice for everything. So then having the same system in the next phase, it's the it also sped up the game. Uh, so I think, uh, and in the end, it's the my playtesters complain to me a lot that it's too weak, it's too weak, it's too weak. Uh, but in the end, it's the, the I think in the end, people are saying hey, maybe it's a bit too powerful. So <laughs> if anything, it's the the I wasn't cautious enough. But the overall, it's the I think uh, the proof is in the pudding. It's what players embraced and the the found enjoyable to use and they they refer back to. And the, the there is still a very large following of the Warhammer Sixth Edition. Uh, so again, it's the if it was completely unwieldable and the the not fun it's it wouldn't be there it certainly made like playing tournaments much easier because you just needed your your dice and your army and your uh army book mm. and when it came to the the play testing then so because obviously there's a lot of 
there was quite a lot of randomness in the fourth and fifth edition magic rules. Obviously, you were like randomizing cards. You were randomizing what power levels you had, even whether or not you could dispel cards in a given turn, uh, dispel mm. spells from your enemy, that sort of stuff. What was your sort of thinking in, okay, how do we... How do we sort of balance this up a little bit and maybe give it a... Yes, there's still going to be randomness here in how much you can achieve and what you can do in a turn, but making it so that you're not totally uh, sort of at the whims of the winds of magic. Well, the, the everything counts by large amounts. Like the more dice you make people to roll, the more likely it is that they will roll an average result. While if you have a card, and it really depends on the the, the next draw, is, is it total power or drain magic? Uh, you introduce on each individual step a much greater chance of the the something that the decides the game that's completely down to uh, uh, luck. So I tried to make it so that the 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 effect would be distilled across the system. So hopefully. They would, they, it wouldn't be all the time that the, the entire battle is the, uh, is rests purely on luck. Sometimes it happens, like there is a break that's, test that's crucial or the your general has to make an armor save, but that's okay because at least there were several steps leading up to it and decisions you took to, to make it to that point, while as opposed to just that, oh, bummer, it's the he drew total power and wasted my army with this spell that's insanely powerful. So the... the uh, my thinking was really that the, let's try to get the people to roll a lot of dice. Uh, so the averages will probably mean that the the effect of the luck gets dampened. Hmm. I always quite like the sort of, uh, it's almost a push your luck system of where well, you can roll more dice, but you're then more likely to miscast your spell and, and cause yourself some damage. And then the, obviously the miscast table was great fun, seeing hmm. wizards just explode or, <laughs> or, or lose their ability to cast spells at all and stuff like that. Yeah, it was also like the which has been lost a lot of the fantasy games. But the 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 ethos of the Warhammer was that magic is dangerous. Like you double with it and you draw, uh, draw too deep, you're gonna pay a terrible price. And I wanted that to be in the system, like the deeply ingrained, and that you felt it was your fault because you pushed <laughs> pushed it. Not just that you had you were unlucky with the draw of card. I mean, of course, both are kind of luck, but at least you made a decision to take that risk is the, rather than that you know you have to draw next card and they, they, you're either lucky or not. Uh, and again, I'm not dunking on the card systems. It's the, the, uh, being, the drawing a lucky card can feel incredibly like the, the uh, empowering and yes, it's the, like the, yeah, the, the getting a straight flush in a, a poker game. There is a, a good thing for that, but I do think that for a war gaming, especially one that you want to also work in tournament, uh, the the atmosphere it's the you don't want people to uh, on the average a better, the player who is playing better should win more games. That was what we did want, but beginners should always have a chance and at the very least an enjoyable game, which again. Averaging the dice rolls help with, with that because if you're a beginner and you have terrible luck, it can be a, you you suffer usually a crushing defeat and feel very bad. Mm. And you, I was thinking about the so the sort of core fundamentals in there about things like how powerful a wizard is and how many spells they have access to and what they can achieve in a given turn. They seem to have been pretty consistent across many editions of, of Warhammer. Were there any other things that were like, well, this has to stay. We have to make sure that this is what we build the system around. Or, or could you have done really anything you wanted? Could you have just completely changed magic entirely if, if you'd wanted to at the time? Um, I could have, but I would have had to explain it to a very formidable game de developers around me. Mm -hmm. uh, like the magic system, it, one also has to remember that the, the, it had it was battle proven tested it's metal it's the uh the four power levels uh both from the point of view of a uh, miniature range and from the point of view of game system it's the they were done by a very very uh capable game designers to begin with so there were good reasons behind why they were implemented that way I could have changed any everything and anything I wanted so of course uh the uh the idea wasn't to uh let people lose what is, what is warhammer we have to remember that the the asking anybody to learn a completely new system or a subsystem that bears no resemblance to what was before 
you are risking on losing people because people are, especially if you've committed a lot of your time and energy and collection to the work within a certain game system, um, you are asking quite a lot for them to throw all that away and start from scratch. Uh, mm -hmm. This is also why you see a lot of core games like that we saw with Dungeons and Dragons. They've gone very much back to what Gary Gygax did in the end. They tried it, the, the 3.5 or 4th edition to, to really go far away. And potentially there was a lot of good things, but you had people with a decades of inbuilt love. Um, it's the, the uh, and, and uh, brain space and asking them to chuck that all away and start from scratch. That's a hard task. Uh, also, often when a system becomes very, 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 very successful and popular, there usually is a good reason for it. There must be something in there that really is the, the, the touchy something within us deeply that the resonates with us. And a, and a system can be brilliant on paper, but it doesn't emotionally connect you to it. I think one of the parts why Warhammer, even though it's quite archaic system by today's standards, uh, there is a reason why 40k still is very much a Warhammer game. There is a sort of a role-playing aspect to it. It's very easy to get into the flow that now I'm wielding a chainsaw or a chaos blade and the I am the, the armor is blocking it is the the or oh, I'm riding this thing this far um it it sort of ties to you with an emotional level even if the the system a more streamlined system might be easier fast or whatever but if it doesn't touch your heart you might not come back to it you might say it's a great system but you might not come back to it hmm. are there any other systems just whilst we're on it that that you've seen out there in the wild that have that feeling for you that you're just like really admire the way something's been designed Catan series on on uh on board games like the uh our solemnist uh mr tober is the was a genius like the 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 systems he built while on a paper insanely simple are deceptively deep and the trading mechanism is extremely engaging and emotional and the 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 social uh and he did a whole series of uh, games that are like the uh, Spacefarers of Catan, the Settlers of Catan, and the, the Seafarers of Catan, and so on and so forth. That all of them were like incredible bestsellers, and they have a uh, are something that everybody who plays board games now and then digs it up, and it, everybody goes, "Yeah, let's play Catan again." Uh, that's a good example of a system that might not win necessarily design award, even though I might think it should. But the the shows its strength. It's the in the emotional engagement, and this is a classic for a good reason. Mm, yeah, absolutely. I mean, thinking back to your what you were just saying there about the sort of the the fundamentals that have been designed and the formidable design that had been done on earlier Warhammer. Did you look back when you were designing the War the Magic System for Sixth Edition? Did you go back to like Third Edition even and sort of say, okay, what what is here that we could use? Because obviously that used a a power-based, a point-based system for the power that the wizards had that you can sort of spend over the course of the game. So that's yeah. that's not a card-based system, and, and those kind of things could have worked. Was that ever on the table? Yeah, but I mean, I looked at it. I mean, the, the, the third edition, while the one that the, the I really fell in love with, Warhammer, is, is the, the with all the good comes so much baggage that the, the in the end it was pretty much unplayable there was so much material and mind-numbing detail that the the uh it actually ground warhammer as a game to a halt because nobody nobody had the had the brain power to play it it's the so uh i looked back to all of it but really what the third edition is the most still resonated with me was the the mood the atmosphere the setting the lore and the i think this is why me and john it's the the uh geld it so well it's the uh geld so well is making the uh realm of chaos because uh you can also see it in the miniatures like the at that point we were still at the red period of games workshop so really bright candy like colors like the toy aspect which was by the on a purpose by the way it's at that point the sales believed that let's make them look like toys so we can sell more of them and the realm of chaos was a stark jump into the the back into the grim dark and the bases were no longer goblin green like it was a a scandal within the studio and the 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 company uh but we persisted and i think it it uh it really helped the uh realm of chaos to stand out 
And I think it ushered the new era because once everybody saw that, okay, is the realm of chaos dare to do something else than Goblin Green Paces? So we can do it elsewhere too. And it was off to the races then. Was it really like a, quite a controversial pitch then for, for that to be like, oh, actually, let's take a different tack on these? Yeah, absolutely. It's the again the 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 like the people with 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 clout were behind it, uh, so there was no argument as such. But the the uh, yeah, it was like the people saw it and went, "Whoa!" Because uh, we were used to doing things in certain way, right? But colors, goblin green bases is the 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 set citadel colors for the reds and the blacks and the greens and the blues for everything. A certain way of highlighting, but the part of that was that the, there was a huge miniature range, and we only had the same amount of time to paint all the models than for a usual army book release. So the heavy metal team had to come up with a faster way to do them, and naturalistic colors. It's the the can be done faster in a way they were done in Realm of Chaos with the the with a skilled hands like that than doing the the like the, the blending and highlighting of individual colors. That was the, the order of the day before. Hmm. Was there anything that you wanted to put into so Realm of Chaos that, that didn't make it into the final release? Yeah, there was more special characters. I couldn't do the, the all that I wanted. Uh, there were the, the troop types, like I wanted to do big Chaos War machines, but the miniature range was already so huge, and the I was running out of time because of getting the, the retinue system to work was a pain in the neck. Uh, it really took a lot of time, and there was a, a long period when I thought that this, this is never going to work. This is going to be the, the greatest disaster in the history, and I'm going to do the like, same thing as everybody else has done with the Realm of Chaos, that it, it collapses onto me and crushes me beneath. <laughs> uh, it's still like everybody else. It still defeats me, but luckily it didn't go that way. It's the the uh, the the god looks after drunks and madmen. <laughs> <laughs> and do you get when you were working on this kind of stuff? Was there like would you take a look at old ranges as well and kind of say, oh, actually, I really love this model. We haven't done anything in this kind of space in ten years or or whatever. Let's try and find a way to bring it back. Yeah, 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 absolutely. There was the classic Jess Goodwin Chaos Champions. It's the we really wanted to bring that individualism back. It's the uh those definitely like the from the artwork, there were the beastmen. It's the I really I looked at the there were the Beastman chariot entries in the old uh, third edition books, and the but there was never any models. And then there was Gorthor. It's the uh that the the was my other character that I really love, which is also the story of the defense, is is my homage to the Finnish Winter War. It's the the like the defense I made the 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 elector count who defended Hochland is the Mikhail Luden uh, It's the I made this really, really hard bastard who then uh the the was actually not very likable, but was the only man for the job. And the like this the the incredible dog defense in depth. And that story is one that a lot of fans come back to me and say, that's my favorite, favorite lore in Warhammer ever. I was very chuffed about that. It's the, the but it was uh, but that again, it needed that strong antagonist. And it allowed me to say that the, the okay, we need to make the care the, the beastman chariot now. <laughs> sure. That's terrific. And then so is there any is there anything else from that sort of work on on either Realm of Chaos or or on the uh, sort of wider sixth edition that you sort of reflect back on and think, you know what, well, I'm I'm super proud of this, or I'm re- I'd love to work on that again or revisit it in some way. Those kind of things that have really been uh, that have stayed with you from working on those systems and rules. Uh, for Chaos, it's the uh, I would really be interested in the looking at the the Chaos more within the enemy within. Like the chaos cults and the the that recruit the 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 followers and the the how you become a chaos uh, warrior a champion of chaos it's the like the the what does a chaos warrior coming from the lands of Arabi look like is the uh, so the enemy within I always I love that term uh, and of course Warhammer being a battle game is the, the dealt with the the actual armies but I really would have been interesting to 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 work more on the the rot within it's mm. the 
Uh, and that's part of why I put the cult of uh, possessed into Mordheim. So the the now that they come from the the the, the masks are off, is then they come and rise now that the the order has broken down. What what are the chaos cults lo uh, look like? So the uh, that's something I would have liked to have done a more work on. Hmm. I suppose the, the there's always that sort of through line, like you say, your relationship with John Blanche that you developed on Realm of Chaos, and then chaos itself as a major influence seems to have really fed into more time and, and sort of it's the the perfect exploration of those kind of ideas and, and working relationships yeah absolutely i mean once we like me work in the realm of chaos and and john felt that they're right it's the i'm finally getting like my vision through here and the the I can because he was never into the 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 uh, period when the everything was a bit more toy like and cartoony and colorful. It's just not John. Mm. It's the taking. By the way, I am not people who worked on that. They they had their marching orders and they did a splendid job. I am not dunking on on that the, the, that approach. But that's not John. So for him, is the seeing that there would be a an sort of a like minded soul in the design department for Mordheim. That, and it was a proven then for the realm of chaos. He felt confident for that. And then, of course, for sixth edition is the, the to have that somebody that would have his back in the from the writing point of view and for the, the fiction point of view. Because, of course, putting a John Blanche's uh, artwork on a page and then an opposite page, putting a sort of very jokey, like a uh, the, the middle school kind of humorous piece, it doesn't work. It's the, the you have to have the synergy between the two. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I know you like working with a sort of uh, I think you call it the closed door and and having these sort of nuggets of information, these unexplored ideas that are sort of peppered through. Were there any in Realm of Chaos that that have sort of never been explored further that you re you remember or have like oh, put in yes. there? Yeah, there was the, the my favorite one is the, the there are the full page illustrations. There is the Great Chaos Wall, which I envisage was the like this the, the version of the Great Wall of China that is in the realm of uh, chaos. But of course, people don't go there and come back. It's the the so there is all sorts of the, the horrible wonders there, uh, like the Eldritch Eldritch Terrors like that, where the Chaos Army is just eternally is the, they fight each other, some defending, some attacking, and completely unrelated to everything else. There was the, the citadel of the, the symmetry, because the John Blanche ran out of time, and we still needed one full page illustration. So he made this the, the picture of a flying fortress, but he only painted the half, and then we mirrored it. And then he did just tiny little changes so it wouldn't be perfectly symmetrical. This this gigantic flying fortress that the, the wanders aimlessly, and he does, does this horrible symmetry to it. Uh, there was all these places that if you made a game set in the realm of chaos would be interesting to uh, study. But those were all closed doors, like they were just a tantalizing hints. And of course, the Archaeans background, which the Games Workshop later explored in great depth, they made several books and obviously the uh, End Times campaign. If you look at it, what I originally wrote for him, he was very much shrouded in mystery. There were multiple stories where he might have come from and the the and the what he was the the uh, uh how he was aiming to do this uh, he was the biggest closed door uh which later on then was opened in a uh probably quite a successful way if you consider the number of alternate models and the books and the campaigns and the products that were tied to that character yeah and the, there was obviously he was a major part in the the storm of chaos as well which happened shortly after you'd left i think so did you uh, did you follow any of that version of the yep. of the sort of close to the end times? How, how did you feel about those stories as well? Well, obviously, I would have done things differently, of course. But the the it's also fascinating to see when somebody takes something you created and see what they do with it. Because hmm. uh, you can also have this sort of an alternate universe theory that there's an infinite possible endings, and this is one of them. Uh, what I would have done would have been different. I mean, to me, the like the new uh, Age of Sigma model for him is the, I totally get it. It's a big model. You can sell it for a lot of money. It's going to be very, it's very profitable. I'm sure it's been a huge seller, no doubt about it. But to me, he was always more for an visually homage to the Frank Frazetta's Death Dealer. It's the the fallen, the ultimate fallen knight on it's his grim black steed. Mm. It's the the like, like this destrier of the immense size. It's the, like the, the, the anti-King Arthur. Um, 
So the I would have, have never gone there. Uh, it's the to me it was important that he was the was the 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 chaos king on his steed, uh, the the this horse that could trample armies on his uh, own. A little bit of a homage to the 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 classic Japanese anime and manga, Fist of the North Star. There is Raouf, the ultimate enemy, who also has the Kokuo, the king of horses, and he was my inspiration for the for the the the, the uh, great uh, chaos uh, steed that the the RK and ride. So yeah, I would have found the things different, but that's not necessarily a um, no bad thing. There should be room for multiple imaginations. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and those stories have obviously. Well, both versions in that sort of multiverse, as you sort of uh, frame it, they they've told really interesting stories, and a lot of people are interested in, in sort of following them. And now, new stories are told with those same characters. So, yeah, like you said, definitely done something right in that it's still persistent even to this day. But you're working on a new game now as well, aren't you? So you you've now uh, put together Trench Crusade, uh, mm-hmm. which is a sort of very different uh, world. I mean, do you want to sort of explain a little bit about that game that you're currently yeah. developing? Yes. Yeah, so, in a nutshell, it's the it's a game where a during uh, the first crusade, a world took a dire different turn. The 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 crusading knights open a door they shouldn't have opened and committed a heresy they shouldn't have committed, and opened the very gate of hell. It's the out of which poured it's the the demons and demonic influence and stirred those people who have evil in their hearts to become uh, heretics. And the there has been now an eight hundred year war, is the the across the globe where the uh, heretic forces little by little have claimed more of the world, uh, and the the it is nineteen fourteen the year of our Lord it's the and the great war is starting anew, and just before the the hostilities resume, uh, with this sort of a think of a mixture of a World War One armies on both sides, but the some with the divine and others with a demonic influence. Uh, there is a huge no man's land, is to think of the, the fields of Verdun, uh, but the thousand times worse, where the small bands of war bands on both sides are sent to sec- uh, gather intel, secure good positions, is the uh, find the, the, the holy and unholy artifacts, is the loot for powerful weapons of the bygone age, it's the, because obviously with the divine, divine influence, there are artifacts of power, relics, that they can be utilized by both sides. And these small war bands just before the eve of the war are clashing in the no man's land. Uh, so it's a uh, World War One game. It's the, which meets the uh, sort of a, a Hellraiser, if you wish. Uh, um, I have a, uh, the really, the the impact there was that this visually, this world has been developed by Mike, uh, Mike from China, which I hope people People will know, for example, as the artist uh, that created the look of the the current Diablo game. So extremely uh, beloved artist, and the uh, uh, him and the James Sheriff, who is doing the the, the core sculpting, is the contacted me and said that we really want to make a game. And I looked at it, and for a long time, it has been that I've went that the on table top that the I really want to actually go through the immense work that. That is involved in a tabletop game of the kind of magnitude that I want to do. Uh, I think I will commit to this. Uh, let's make this. And the the of the races it was then. And the uh, the idea there really is that the a lot of people have asked me that the would you do Mordheim again? And I said, well, sure, but I already did it. And the anyway, Games Workshop owns it, so if they would ever do it, it is unlikely they would ask me to do it. They have a different system now for making games. Uh, also, I don't think that they they would find it economical to hire me. Uh, and the the I do like the, the going over new ground. So this is something that the the it it has all the things that I enjoyed uh, about Mordheim. Smaller bands. It's the the uh, a narrative driven campaign system. Interesting scenarios that I can create. A wonderful sort of meaty world that I can explore and the detail with the, the with my compatriots. Uh, but the, the it also isn't the same like the with the much more advanced firearms and technology uh i have a new kind of the the areas to explore as a rules writer that i couldn't do in fantasy so the to me it's really is in many ways the best of the both worlds i am incredibly proud of the the games 
system I've created. Let's see if it resonates with the audiences. But those far, the the playtest feedback has been beyond positive. So I am I am feeling very good about this. I mean, of course, as a game designer, you have to believe in what you're making because you can't do it otherwise. Uh, but the I I think it's the best system at least game logic wise the, the the best system I've ever made. Obviously, it'll be the the people playing who will ultimately decide that. But the the I have faith in it, a great faith. Great. And is that you said it's a World War One technology and stuff? Is there is it sort of what we would recognize as World War One technology, or has the demonic influence and the divine influence kind of changed the stuff that people are walking around with and using? Yes, you you would recognize like the guns, bolt action rifles, the the World War One machine guns, grenade uh, uh, launchers, artillery. Uh, the the these would all be known to you. But we really wanted to, so it wouldn't be just people is the taking pot shots from trenches. It's the we really went to town with the that the metallurgy has taken a different turn because of the the divine and the demonic guidance, and the armor is a magnitude more effective than in is in our world. So a heavily armored knights, in essence, and melee weapons are just as viable as a long range weapons. So with the, the thick enough armor, you can withstand hail of bullets, not always, but the, the quite often, and the, the engage in melee combat. While of course, it's equally valid of the, the putting up a machine gun position and the mowing down opponents. And then of course, there is the supernatural, which will have an uh, additional resistance to, uh, uh, to, to, to missile attacks. So it allowed us to sort of marry the Crusader Knight uh, armor aesthetic to the World War I, which I think produces a really unique look. Also, Mike from China is not a big fan of <laughs> drawing faces, so the, the, it allows him to do a lot of helmets and masks, is the, which makes sense in this world where the, the, the metal mask can withstand a uh, high-caliber ammunition fire. Great. And this is sort of still developing, isn't it? So there's still a little way to go before this is on the on the streets, I guess. Yes. So we are launching a Kickstarter next year, and the playtest rules are hopefully out with the a larger population of the, the backers of the initial test Kickstarter by the end of this year. So the course, I am of the mind that the, if the people like the system, they will support it. So no point keeping it secret once I think it's ready for playtesting. So hopefully a people will be able to try it out very soon. Uh, but yes, it's the not that long. We have a we've had a lot of the the uh people join in that the i could could only dream of dave gallagher it's the is doing some art for us as well uh there is a saint decent is the who people know is one of the the very very respected sculptures in the in the business is the, is doing our heretics so the there is a lot of people that i think can deliver it in a quality that the is required i don't think I can say to people who are fans of my previous games that, yep, this is as good as the anything I've done if if the if the quality of the production isn't where it needs to be, as the I think people are expecting certain level, and uh, I think we can deliver. Fantastic. That sounds great. So definitely one to watch as it sort of continues to to evolve and develop and more information gets shared over time. I'm and let's do this again once the 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 playlist rules are out. It's the and you've had a chance to dive in and the the give me your thoughts. Oh, I'd love that. Yeah, I'd, I mean, I'd love to sort of explore how you go about developing a game from scratch. So yeah, definitely, mm -hmm. I think that'd be really good. But thank you very much, Thomas, for for taking the time to chat with me today. Uh, I really really appreciate it. So thanks for coming on. It was awesome. Thank you. Let's do it again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Thomas, for joining me and talking me through your time designing the chaos and the curses and the spells of Warhammer. It was absolutely fantastic to get your perspective on all of those significant changes and how things played out. If you enjoyed my conversation with Thomas, then you may want to check out my Patreon, where you can access an exclusive interview I conducted with him earlier this year to talk about his time designing and creating more time and evolving and developing Warhammer 6th edition. On my Patreon, there are also exclusive interviews with other GW alums and extended versions of some of the interviews that I've released here on YouTube. Plus, you get access to my monthly live stream on the latest GW books as part of my book club. So every month I am reading one of the GW books, the original 17 that were released, and we talk about them online, live, in real time, before I then record my YouTube book club with my friend Stu. And 
There is a Discord available as well with some private channels just for patrons, but anybody can come along and join that Discord, and I will put a link to the Discord server and my Patreon in the description below. Thank you very much for watching. I am Jordan, and this is Jordan Sorcery.